Welcome to Let's Talk. Today, we're here with Landon Campbell. Landon, who are you and why should people care? Uh, I'm the general manager for Chicago for Drive Capital. We are the largest venture capital firm between the coasts. Based in Columbus, Ohio, but I'm building out a Chicago office. And uh, why should you care? You should care because I'm bullish on Chicago, man. I'm very excited about this city, investing in this city, building community in this city for founders. And I really do feel like this is Chicago's renaissance period and we all need to have that same energy. Absolutely. I, I think I heard something recently as far as so many people are leaving Chicago because all the taxes and everything and yeah. the politics, right? The politics behind what's going on in Chicago and kind of where the market was trending at the time. So many people were leaving. They're going to Florida, they're going to Texas. Now there's a lot of people that are kind of staying in Chicago and they're, they're rooting their grounds and they're finding their, their roots where they are. Whether they're from Chicago or they're from another coast. Yeah. Like you said, you were from California. I'm from California. Most of the people I hang out with and know, especially from Drive Capital, my firm, like, are from California. We started our careers in California. You know, with a topic like that, I feel like Chicago is unlucky a lot of times with the headlines. You know, like a lot of people will always point to the negativity in the city. And here, Chicagoans were so humble, you know, we just ignore a lot of it. Um, let people, you know, talk the mess that they want right. to talk. But I really think that the city, we need cheerleaders. Like we are the greatest city in the US, third largest city in the US. Um, one of the last cities are probably, you know, will be, um, at least you know, compared to some of the ones that you mentioned, that will have fresh water, have sustainable energy. You know, we have the second highest concentration of Fortune 500s here. Um, so my advice for anyone that's looking at the negative headlines, you really need to dig deeper into the data. Like, yes, you know, some of the demographic reports will say that people have been migrating outside of the city of Chicago. But when you really look at the data on that, that headline, for example, you'll see that Chicago is getting smarter. Like Chicago is becoming more college educated. The people who are getting to move to this city, you know, are helping our city. You know, they're, um, you know, living lives with higher salaries, they're buying more homes. Um, Chicago is the second top destination nationally for college grads. And as we were talking about a second ago, 80% college grads just in the Midwest alone will end up in Chicago. Um, so it's, it's crazy to hear that because I really do feel like we are the last affordable um, big city. Right. Uh, and we'll continue to have people move here. So I'm not, not worried. Affordable. I'm not worried. But I will say we need to market this city much better. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we talked a little bit about why people are coming to Chicago. Obviously, you didn't start in Chicago and your journey didn't start here in the city. Can you give everyone a little bit of a background on who you are and where you where you started, your, your story? Yeah, so I moved here from California, born and raised in Oakland. Didn't know much about Chicago. You always hear Chicago's a flyover city. Like, I get it, you know, this is never a place that Northern I vacation. Capital of the United States. Yeah, exactly. Like, this is never a place that I vacationed with my family, never, um, you know, visited. But when I first visited Chicago on a college tour in uh, probably 2014, really fell in love with this city. Um, I was just mesmerized, you know, by our architecture, the opportunities here. And I just questioned, like, why is no one talking about this great city? Like, right. we, need, we need to put this city on a pedestal more often. Um, so when I moved here, because I didn't know anybody, didn't have any family or friends here, when I moved here, like, I, I used that energy, I channeled it to just get involved, like, get out in the city, work with as, as many companies as I could, learn from the greatest entrepreneurs and founders in this city. Um, and that really exposed me to you know, how great the city is. Absolutely. So you've been doing what you're doing now. Can you explain to everyone kind of a little bit more about what you do now and yep. how you got into that industry? So Drive Capital started uh, before my time, obviously, a little over a decade ago. Our founder, Chris, um, was an investor at a very prominent, very well-known venture capital firm in Silicon Valley. And he had the first insight. Like, firms like his in Silicon Valley and many others were just blatantly ignoring all the opportunities that existed in cities like Columbus, Chicago, Pittsburgh, Austin, Atlanta. Like to think that you just have to be in this one concentrated area, San Francisco or Silicon Valley, to build a multi-billion dollar company is, you know, it's preposterous. Like you, you could be anywhere. Uh, so that's what led to the creation of Drive. But I joined Drive um, in 2022 to build out our Chicago office to really plant the flag that we're here to invest and support entrepreneurs in this city. Not just any entrepreneurs though. I mean, the founders that are wildly ambitious, the founders that are focused on solving 
really important problems uh, for a diverse range of different customer types. So I'm here, you know, this is our 10,000 square foot office in Chicago. The office officially opened a little over a year ago. We have uh, five companies working out of the space that we've invested in and about like an extra five or six that you know, are friends of the firm, folks who we could invest in in the future that will join us and co-work out of this office. We, we constantly have events here for the community. We utilize our rooftop for that too. We just want to support the future founders of this great city. Absolutely. So you touched a little bit on how companies can really be started anywhere. Yeah. And especially with technology today and how rapidly it's growing, I know we talked about this a little bit earlier, was artificial intelligence and, yep. and how that's rapidly increasing and how it only is looking up from here. How are you guys currently applying things like artificial intelligence, ChatGPT, the most prominent one, and adding it into your business and growing and being able to see, where do you guys kind of see where technology is going? Yep, in, we apply it in so many different ways for so many different customers. So that's another thing I'll point to. In Silicon Valley, you might only have like a few different types of personas or customers that you can get in front of. Um, and maybe a lot of the companies that are built there and founded there, you know, that they're optimizing for the attention and the eyeballs of the, the firms there. But here, I mean, whether it's our you know, rich history in manufacturing and robotics, um, you know, all of the universities that we have here, like that, you know, we can build future education technology companies here. Um, all of the different consumers we have here and shoppers, like you have so many different customer bases that you can go after in Chicago. And I think that's what also makes our city very unique. We have all this, you know, you have close proximity to a very diverse group of right. different customers, different industries. So everything that you see, like all of these buildings, whether it's Boeing, uh, you know, for aerospace, Motorola for communications, like you have so many different industries here. And all of those industries, all of those customers are gonna need future technologies. So it's awesome that we can you know, build out of this office, but you can get in front of any customer you need, you can get in front of any consumer you need uh, to you know, help them solve a true problem. Absolutely. So obviously, we were talking about how a lot of people are leaving the city, but a lot of people are still grounding roots. Like you were mentioning, Boeing, Motorola, they're still planting those seeds here. Yep. They're, they're looking for 20 years down the line. Yeah. They're not looking for what's gonna happen in the next five years or the next two years, three years. I think that a lot of young entrepreneurs nowadays are only looking short term. Yep. They only see the next, oh, how can I make $10,000 a month? Oh, how can I make $100,000 a year, you know? How do you suggest, or what advice would you give to those young entrepreneurs that are striving, that may not be in a city like Chicago, but they're looking for that next opportunity to where they can actually plant their seeds and start developing as a young entrepreneur? Yeah, I'd say action produces information. Like we really encourage our companies in the early innings, like before you have anything figured out, you gotta constantly experiment. You gotta try new things until you reach what we call product market fit. We talk about product market fit a lot in the tech world, but you know, I, I think you could find product market fit across any industry. And product market fit really means just you have a core group of customers that are obsessed with your product. They, they're using your platform every day. It's saving their lives. Um, you know, it's, it's part of their stack, like they need it uh, in order to do their jobs better, in order to be a better human, whatever that might be. So I think you have a lot of firms that will tell entrepreneurs, like, rush to turn on revenue and get money as quickly as possible. And that's a very important indicator whether or not people are willing to pay for something. But I think for us, we're always really focused, at least for the early companies, on engagement and retention. Like, how do you find not, you don't need thousands of users tomorrow, but imagine you could find like 50 to 100 or a few hundred of folks that love what you're doing. Like they're gonna be advocates for what you're building, they're using it, um, and they become obsessed with it. Once you find that obsession, then you can turn on the revenue engines anytime. Right. Um, so really optimizing for patient, the, uh, you know, just patient obsession, I should say. How do you think that social media has affected people's ability to see the battlefield in terms of entrepreneurship. Yes. I mean, <laughs> I talk about this all the time. I, I, it's very general, it's very general. No, question. no, it's a great question. Um, you know, I'll kind of just, you know, I'll, I'll answer you that with sort of how I, um, you know, sort of talk to people about it because there, there's so much transformation happening in the world right now. There's a new model coming out. 
there, there's a new, you know, sort of robotic. I mean, like every single day, it's like there's, wow. I mean, there's a new thing coming out. If you look at ChatGPT, you know, in November of 2022, I believe when it sort of started to sprout versus now, like it's ten times better now. Right. So to think that a year from now it's just going to be the same, um, you know, it's a crazy thought. Like these things are evolving every day. So the answer to your question, it can be overwhelming to, you know, figure out who to follow and you know, which newsletters to read, and blogs to, um, you know, consume, to follow up with the rapid pace of technology. It's something that you need to do, but understand that there's so much noise out there, um, and you really need to do your best to find the sources that are gonna serve you in the right way. And my personal belief is that um, who you surround yourself with is, is equally as important. So we've, we've built a lot of rooms, like, you know, we have the fastest growing AI club in Chicago. It's a group, it's a very, intentionally curated group of engineers and developers that come and talk about research papers. They come and show off projects that they're working on. Like I, I'm a huge believer that community building uh, can help solve for a lot of the noise. Absolutely. Because um, yeah, I mean, it's great that we have access to all the information in the world, but at the same time, that can become a huge distraction. Right. But you have to keep up with it. It's a lot of fluff. It's a lot of fluff. A yeah. lot, a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of noise. Yeah, a lot of combing through a bunch of stuff that it can matter or it doesn't matter. You can really choose. Yeah. So obviously you're talking about how you build community and how important community is in terms of building something that's ever growing. Yep. And building a circle of individuals who are constantly just looking forward. Yep. Right. And I like to say this all the time is that cars only have such a small rear view mirror for a reason. Right. You want to be looking forward, but you, you do have to look backward. Yep. So how do you think that the best communities are built? Do you think that they're leader oriented or do you think that they're more oriented on the interaction between the members? Yes, I, I think the best communities all have a shared sense of belonging. People know why they're there um, and what they're there for. And you know, I, I think with that, being intentional about why you're putting that group together is so important. I think a lot of people, whether they're hosting events or building communities, they just focus on the what. Like I wanna host an AI event, or you know maybe even the location, like I wanna host it here. But it's rare that they're starting that process thinking like who needs to be in that room and why? Like right. why will everybody be spending their Tuesday night um, once a month to come to Drive Capital to learn about the future of technology and AI? So I think it's very important to be intentional with that um, and always ask like, why does this room need to be put together? And I, I also think there's a huge difference between an audience and a community. Absolutely. In an audience, you have someone at the top. Like there always has to be a facilitator, but the person at the top is always just sort of, you know, they're the leader, they're talking, people are listening. The best communities on the other hand are opportunities where people learn from each other. Um, they, you know, they're connecting, they're teaching each other, so then it just becomes like this living, breathing sort of you know, organism where folks are growing together. They're learning from each other, they're helping each other. So I think that's very important. And the last thing I'll say there, I'm friends with a lot of well-known developers and architects in Chicago. Um, one of my good friends, Jeff Shapak, shout out to him, built this office. He, he's the founder of Fulton Market. So this area that we're in right now, it's not, it's not called the West Loop. It's actually very specifically branded as Fulton Market. Like he put up most of these buildings. But if you ask the best architects, well, what do you, what do you do? You know, like none of them will tell you or just tell you that I build buildings. Like they always say I build experiences. So the building is just a conduit. You know, the community is sort of just a conduit to bring people together. But what happens? you know, in between those walls, that is true community. Absolutely. And I think that nowadays people really misinterpret what community is. A lot of people look at community like a cult. Yes. Right? Especially with social media, right? They'll all kind of crowd around one individual and they'll be like, oh, this guy, praise this guy. But they don't really understand what's going on between those people that yeah. are, are following that person. If there's no real growth, it's really just a cult. We see a lot of cults, and I'd say that, yeah, most of those are audiences. They're not communities. Yeah, exactly. Yep. So in our definitions, I think that a cult and a definition and a, and a audience is something similar. So just to kind of wrap everything up, I like to ask this question just because it's a really interesting thing 
that people don't think about, but it's something that directly impacts their ability to kind of grow and, and perceive what's going on in the world. Yep. What kind of music do you listen to? <laughs> I love the question. Everything. Um, I mean, I grew up on hip hop, listen to hip hop probably you know, the most, but I'd say um, my favorite genre type time period of music, like Motown, circa 60s, 70s, 80s, um, a lot of the soul music, like the classic oldies, um, just the storytelling ability of a lot of those artists were unparalleled. And that, hands down, would be my favorite type of music to listen to. And, you know, with that, like, we need more storytellers. Right. We need people who can tell captivating stories and inspire people and bring those individuals together to help them build. So I'm, I'm a huge uh, storyteller, and I, I believe that's one of the most powerful um, traits that a, a human can have. Yep. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, man. That's a wrap to this episode. This is Landon Campbell. Make sure you go follow him. Go check him out on all of his social medias. Yep. If you want to tag yourself or anything, let yeah, him yeah. know. Yeah, um, yeah. It's L-A-N-D-O-N 20S, Landon 20s on Twitter and Instagram. And then I have a weekly newsletter talking about, you know, Chicago. Right? It's called The Driver's Seat. And that's an example of how important it is to talk about our city. Like, right. yeah. not all the negativity, but like, how can we be more optimistic for the future of Chicago? So, it's thedrivechicago.com. Perfect. Thank Appreciate you so much. Yeah, yeah.